Well, gentlemen and ladies, thanks for the chance to speak to you today. I just want to say, can we give Jack a round of applause for this? He and I have been in touch for probably five years, and this is the first time that we've actually had a chance to meet in person. So I'm glad that the timing worked out that I could be here today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the moment that God used to change my life forever. Um, and really, it was a call to ministry that I didn't see coming. But I'd like to set it up by just saying, I think if I look back on it now, we're almost at the 30th anniversary of Black Hawk Down. It's in just a few weeks. In fact, there's lots of international media attention, lots of events that are going on to commemorate this thing. And now looking back 30 years later, I think what happened to me personally is I switched teams and didn't even know it. I'll give you uh, some scripture that may put that, context, that quote into context. Um, but I'd like to just tell you why I carved some time out of the schedule to be up here with you. Um, I have a really intense fall just because of all of the events around the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of Somalia. Um, but Jack started talking to me years ago about this organization, about who you are, and about what you represent all over the world. And I really think um, most of the world doesn't understand the value that you bring to our society, that you bring not just to the United States, but to your country. I really don't think most people will ever be able to grasp how important your life, your ministry, and the people that you minister to are. I don't think that we can understand it unless you've seen what it looks like if it's not there. And um, I'll just tell you briefly, the absolute morons in the United States that started screaming to defund the police would never in a million years make those statements if they've seen what I've seen. And that's why I, I'm so honored to be with you guys. So let me explain the circumstances in Somalia before I talk about my part in Somalia. Um, very, very limited uh, role in Somalia. But most of you in this room are old enough to remember a massive concert. It was held in the UK. Artists from all over the world showed up, and they did a benefit concert called Live Aid. You guys remember that? Yeah. Do you remember what Live Aid, what the money for that concert was going to? It was going to buy food for people that were starving to death in Africa. Specifically, the Horn of Africa, Eritrea, Djibouti, Afghanistan, or I mean uh, Eritrea, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. The epicenter was Somalia. There was a drought. Some of you uh, remember these conditions from Africa. That drought led to a famine. That famine led to starvation. And if you are older, uh, uh, as old as I am, you remember the nightly news showing you the pictures of babies with distended stomachs. Uh, and they were dying, the, st the statistics said, International Red Cross, by a, they were dying by the numbers of 1,000 a day. We're 300,000 dead into this famine when the United Nations says, it's time for us to do something. And the United States Marines landed on the beaches of Somalia in December of 1992 and started to open up supply routes to hand out food to the people of that country. Now, not just Somalia, Kenya and Ethiopia as well, and trying to distribute food from Addis Ababa down to Nairobi. But when the United Nations shows up to Somalia, it is an entirely humanitarian effort and I think a noble effort, meaning nobody's there to try to steal your natural resources. We're, they're not there for your, for your land. We're not there to gather uh, more political power. It's entirely there to just help somebody stay alive by handing them a bag of beans and a bag of rice. That's literally what's going on in Somalia. Today, having been there, multiple times now, having returned to Somalia 20 years later, 
I can say, unlike any place that I've ever been in the world, and I've been in some of the world's most ugly and deadly and evil spots on the globe, today Somalia is by all measures a failed state. And what makes Somalia a failed state today, like it was in December of 1992, is there was no police. There was no functional government. In fact, the government had kind of ran away as cowards whenever some armed thugs started doing their things. And I don't need to tell you guys in this room, or you ladies, what happens when there's nobody there to restrain evil. So here's what happens. There's a little local drug. It's still very common in this part of Africa, highly distributed across Somalia, a little root of a plant called cot, and that drug starts to become the drug of choice for the warlords in Somalia. Not only do they have drugs, but they have guns, and there's no law enforcement, there's no military to stop evil men from doing whatever they want. Seven warlords are in the capital city of Mogadishu, and these seven warlords are basically trying to become the most powerful man in the country. Now, everywhere in the world since the beginning of time, the way that they're going to do that is by using violence. This is what Cain did with his brother Abel, and it's still happening today all over the world. So we shouldn't be surprised about Somalia or about the streets of Los Angeles in some riots or wherever this will happen tomorrow. The city of Mogadishu becomes kind of the... United Nations food distribution site. They're in Kismayo, they're in a few other places, but it's basically Mogadishu is the attempt to get food to the people of Somalia. This is all portrayed in the first 30 seconds of the movie Black Hawk Down with the words on the screen, but there's no way you can do years of geopolitics and years of economy in 30 seconds of a major movie. So over the spring and the summer of 1993, the United Nations is trying to hand out food. The United Nations is trying to create an environment where the people, the refugees from all over the country can come to this place and can get enough food to keep their family alive. But these warlords are fighting each other. And sometime late spring of 93, one of those warlords makes a strategic decision to start to fight the United Nations. His goal is if I can control, if I can take over the food distribution sites, I can starve my enemies into submission. They're already dying of starvation anyway. If I can control the food, everybody has to do what I, I want them to do. And literally, he starts to starve his own people. So Muhammad Farah Aidid and his Habergetter clan, are, they start to do some missions against the United Nations. They first start to attack U.S. food convoys as they're driving through the city streets. They start to blow up the vehicles and capture the food or destroy the food. Just going to control the food and starve my country into doing what I, I tell them to do. In the summer of 93, while there's about 13 countries from the United Nations in Mogadishu, Aidid's clan ambushes a United Nations food distribution site run by the Pakistanis, and he murders all 24 of the Pakistani United Nations workers. Now, I'm in the Army at this point. I'm in, I've been uh, in the special operations in this special operations unit, this clandestine special operations unit my whole career. We're actually doing some intense training together. The whole U.S. military, all of the special operations forces from all branches of the military, we're all training together. And in the middle of this massive training cycle, a handful of us get a call, stop what you're doing, go to the East Coast. We're going to get ready to go overseas for a real world mission. What I find out about is this United Nations, uh, after this ambush of the food distribution site, the UN Security Council got together. And the UN Security Council said, okay, uh, something must be done about ID. And we can't let this thing stand. We have to bring this guy to justice. In other words, what the world's most powerful leaders, as Ken will tell you, 
in the Security Council said is, if there's nobody to restrain evil, well, let me just ask you, most of you already probably know this quote by, this very famous quote by Edmund Burke. All it takes for evil to triumph in the world is what? For good men to do nothing. So the United Nations Security Council basically said, we've got to do something. And they decided to respond with a very small <clears throat> surgical force from the U.S.'s special operations community. It was a handful of rangers, about, a, about a, a one company of us. It was a helicopter unit and then some forces, special operations forces from all branches of the military. We came together and our plan was to go to Somalia while the rest of the United Nations is doing food distribution and humanitarian relief, we're going to do United Nations operations in Somalia phase two, kill or capture ID. Hmm. 200 assaulters go into the city streets. We're going to take down ID. We're going to take down the top ranking leadership in his clan. And our plan is to get in the city, get the mission done, and get out of there in less than six weeks. That's the goal. Now, I've, I've been in the military, I've been to combat, I've been around blood, and I've been around bullets before. My first experience in combat was kicking off the invasion of Panama when the United States went down there to restore democracy. But really, the special operations force that I was with went down there to go get the country's leader, Manuel Noriega. For us, that was the mission inside the mission. Go capture Noriega, go bring him back to the States. He's gonna spend the rest of his life in a jail in Miami. I got in firefights in Panama and got shot up on special operations aircraft. I went off to Kuwait a year later and I'm involved in this fight against Saddam Hussein and his illegal invasion of Kuwait. And I get in a firefight in Kuwait as well in Desert Storm. But the fight that I saw in Somalia is unlike anything that I've seen before and a whole lot of deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan after nothing comes close to this fight. Those of you who know Somalia and Mogadishu, it's a little small city by all standards on the Indian Ocean. It has about 1.5 million refugees and there is an almost unlimited amount of guns for anybody who will fight for ID. So we send the force in there. We start to take down Idid's clan. Our goal is to take down the top ranking leadership. And we start to hit targets. And we're making uh, some strides, but it has taken us far longer than we expected. And we get a tip on Sunday afternoon, October 3rd, that there is two high profile bad guys from Idid's clan meeting in the same building at the same time. Now, in my entire career in special operations, I don't think I have done three missions during daylight hours in my lifetime. Thousand missions at night, but not three in my lifetime, in the day. And that's because with our capabilities, with our training, with our technology, we've got this huge advantage at night. And now, for the first time ever, we've seen two bad guys in the same building. We've never seen two guys, two two high value targets in the same building, let alone in the same building in the same part of town. This is way too important to pass up. But everybody knows when the big boss starts talking about launching the force during daylight hours, this is the part of town that's controlled by ID. It's broad daylight. And the only way in and the only way out is going to be a fight. All of us know that. And if we go in and do this thing in broad daylight, we also know there's a good chance that most of us don't come out alive. And if we don't get in and out of there in less than 30 minutes, the entire city is going to collapse in on this force. We all knew that. That was the plan going in. So we launched the force to go get these two guys. Um, Special operators go in on little birds and they land on the rooftops and they start to assault the building from the roof down. Other rangers from my unit go in on Black Hawk helicopters and slide down ropes and they place blocking positions at each of the four corners of the target building. Their job is to keep the whole city out of the building 
while the special operators are taking it down. And we timed this thing so that as the helicopters are pulling off of the target and dropping everybody in, I would show up with a long column of Humvees. We'd wait about a half a block away from the target. We'd wait for the call that the building is secure and the bad guys are in our control. We drive up the last half block, everybody gets on the Humvees and we're out of there in less than 30 minutes. Well, as everybody in this room who's ever been in a gunfight knows, nothing ever goes according to plan when bullets start to fly. And while the helicopters are going in, while the rangers are sliding down the ropes, this scene is really well depicted in Black Hawk Down. One of those rangers missed the rope. I have no idea to this day how that's even possible. But he fell in the city streets and he landed head first. So when I get to the target, when I get there with the Humvees half a block away from the target, I'm already getting a call from my boss saying, Jeff, we need you to get to the blocking position, pick up Todd Blackburn, and drive him back to our surgeon. Let me tell you how amazing, how talented this force was. The guy who was the unit surgeon, this very ex experienced, very, very highly educated medical doctor, also happened to be the son of the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. The General of the United States Army's son was our surgeon and some of the most talented leaders on the planet were leading this force. And I, ride, uh, I run up to get to Blackburn and placed him on a stretcher. He didn't have any protection around him. He had a couple of our medics working on him, trying to keep him alive just to get him back to our base where the surgeon is. And I placed him on a cargo Humvee, which is like a pickup truck. The medics are right next to him on his left and right, and I have a ranger squad of about 12 men that are on two vehicles. I'm usually in the lead vehicle. One of my team leaders is in the vehicle behind me, and I call my boss and say, listen, I'm going to take my squad and Blackburn in these three Humvees. We'll provide some guns and prote protection, and we'll get Blackburn out of the city streets and back to the base. Now, we're already under gunfire. And it's far enough over our heads that I'm not really that concerned about the firefight at this point. I'm more concerned about Blackburn's injuries because it's not good. Um, so I drive down a narrow alleyway. We're going pretty slow because of the roads, uh, potholes, the debris in the roads, even roadside bombs hidden underneath the debris in the road. And I tell the guy who's driving my Humvee to drive really slowly and avoid all those potholes so we don't do more damage to Todd Blackburn's head and neck injuries in the vehicle behind us. And when we turned that corner, it was like the entire city erupted with gunfire on these three Humvees. <clears throat> now, because a lot of you in this room have already been in a gunfight, you know how intense this is. But let me explain this to you. That road that we're on is about the size of this room. And every building around us, every window, every doorway, every rooftop, every alleyway had automatic gunfire. They were 10 feet away from us. There are rocket propelled grenades coming across both sides of the street at the same time. And guys are just lobbing hand grenades at us from the rooftops because you can't miss from that distance. And I've got a guy on top of my Humvee who has a Browning 50 caliber machine gun, who is an absolute, uh, uh, he is an absolute amazing machine gunner who's been in the Army for less than a year. And he's holding the trigger down and he's spraying bullets all over the place. And obviously he's not being very effective that way. And so I start to direct him to shoot at the left side of the Humvee and pick up all of the Somali militia on the left side. There's another guy sitting in the back seat of my vehicle who also has a machine gun. His name is Dominic Pilla. And I tell Pilla to take the machine gun and face the right side of the vehicle. I'm going to take care of all of the Somali fighters to the front of the vehicle, and another guy sitting in the back will take care of the rear. And for those of you who have uh, been planners in this room, you know what I'm doing now. I'm trying to distribute fire, and I'm just trying to keep us all alive long enough to make it back to the base. 
and down the road on the right side, hiding in the bushes waiting for us, not even 10 feet away from us when we get next to him, is a Somali gunman. And when we get next to him, he sees Dominic Pella. And these two guys shoot and kill each other at the same moment. Now, the movie really downplays the blood on purpose because there was some concern that it would be rated X for violence, which is the kiss of death if you're trying to make money with a movie. But Pillow was shot in the forehead, and it took off most of his head, and he was killed instantly. In fact, he was dead before his body hit the floorboard. And that's the moment that my boss called me and asked me for a status report. And just like you see in the movie, I did everything I could to play it off, to try to blow him off. He wouldn't let it go. I don't know to this day what his problem was, but just to get him off of the back, off my back. And we're never supposed to use real names, even over this secure network. I just yelled into the handset, Pilla's dead and I'm busy, and threw the, the radio down. Now, when I made that call, the whole force went silent over the command net because everybody realized, uh-oh, not only is this the first guy killed in action, but it's so bad that it's probably going to be me next. Mm. So we had to fight our way all the way back to the base. I don't have time to tell you about all of that today. But when I got back there, the scene is total chaos. The medics are running up to my Humvee to try to get to Dominic Pilla, pull him off of the back of the Humvee. The surgeon is trying to get to Todd Blackburn to see if he's still alive. Vehicles are already shot to pieces. Everybody in the vehicles are totally overwhelmed by what we just went through. And as a very, very committed Christian, as a guy who Jesus radically changed at 13 years old, at the uh, at that airfield in Somalia, I remember thinking, God, I should be dead right now. This is a supernatural event that I survived that kind of gunfire. From 10 feet away with an AK-47, you can't miss. How is it that I didn't get killed? How is it that everybody on the vehicles are not dead right now? And then my platoon leader, Lieutenant Larry Moores, walked up to me. And he said, hey, Jeff, we've just had a second Black Hawk get shot down. The first crash site where uh, Cliff Wolcott's helicopter went down, we've already put the search and rescue force in. This is our reserve force. We don't have anybody left now. And Mike Durant's helicopter's now crashed in the city. And so, Jeff, I need you to get back on the Humvees and see if there's anybody alive at the Durant crash site. This is that scene that in the movie Black Hawk Down where one of the special operators really happened, uh, walks up to me and he says, hey, Sergeant, if you, he came back with me. He was in the whole firefight with me and he said, hey, Jeff, if you're really gonna go back out in those city streets, don't leave your men in the back of that Humvee and all of that blood. He said, man, that'll really, really mess him up if you do that. So I go send the rest of the guys, go get some more ammunition, go get some more fuel. We're going to turn this thing around and we got to get back out there as soon as we can. But I pulled this one Humvee off to the side and we didn't have running water. So I'm just using buckets and my bare hands trying to clean this thing up as fast as I can. And I will never, ever forget what it felt like at the back of that Humvee in that, on that airfield in Somalia. You see, it's just me and one or two of my guys. Everybody else is getting ready to go back out to the Durant crash site. And I'm at the back of that vehicle. And immediately, I start to think about my men. I don't know if anybody survived the two crash sites, but the only guy that's been killed in action in the entire force just got hit about 12 inches away from me when he got killed. And if I drive the rest of my guys through, that, through those city streets again, there'll be 11 more body bags to fill tomorrow morning. I was also thinking about my wife, my high school sweetheart, who she and I had been married for about three years, and we've been trying to have a baby for three years. And I got a letter in the mail in Somalia a couple of days in saying that she was already pregnant with our first child. And I was thinking, I'm never going to see my wife, and my child will never even know who their father is. But one of the greatest privileges of my life is to serve with the men and women that have the level of commitment to each other that these special operators did. You see, rangers to this day get up every morning and they swear their life to one another. They literally pledge their life to each other daily. 
in what's called the Ranger Creed. And they tell each other that I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. I will fight if I am the last man and my last breath, I will do whatever it takes to accomplish the mission. And I'm at the back of that Humvee and I start to think, if I go back out in those city streets, every one of my men are gonna die. If I don't go back out in those city streets, the guys at that Durant crash site are gonna die. There's no way around it. A lot of people are gonna die tonight. And every fiber of my being was terrified and didn't wanna go out there. This was truly the suicide mission, but also this is what I had pledged my, my life to my buddies that I would do. If this is what it comes to, then I'm, I'm willing to do it for you because I know you'll do it for me. And at the back of that Humvee, I was scared unlike I've ever been scared before in my life. It was, I don't think I'm gonna die, I am 100% certain I'm going to die in the next few moments. And without stopping what I was doing, I started to pray. And the prayer was very simply, God, I'm scared. God, I'm in trouble. And God, I need your help. I'm not begging. I'm not negotiating. I'm just telling you I'm scared and I need your help right now. And at the back of that Humvee, the Lord started to remind me of something that I had settled in my soul at 13 years old. He started to remind me that, Jeff, you said when you were a teenager that you were placing your life in my hands. Did you really mean that? Because if you really meant it then, it's just as true today as it was at 13 years old. Amen. And Jeff, I have got you in the palm of my hand. And let me remind you, when I've got you in the palm of my hand, no one and nothing can snatch you out I am in control of the universe. I decide what happens next. And then it became really clear to me, very simple. Look, I'm just a simple guy. So it became like very simple to me at the back of that Humvee. Maybe God does a miracle. At no point did I ever get the impression from him that he was going to let me live. Tonight's the night. Tonight I'm going to die. I already know that's going to happen. But I got this, uh, you know, I just started to think about it in these two terms. Maybe God lets me live. And if he does, then maybe I go home to Georgia and our baby that's on the way. But if not, if tonight's the night, and I'm pretty sure that it is, before my body hits the ground, I know where my soul will spend eternity. Amen. And I had this moment of clarity where I started to realize, go home to Georgia, go home to heaven. In either case, it doesn't matter what happens next. No matter what the world throws at me, I have nothing to fear. And you have this little booklet in front of you because I really believe that's the moment that I started to realize what a bulletproof faith looks like. So I get back on those Humvees and I drive back out in the crash site and I go through multiple ambushes. I bring wounded rangers from my unit back to the base and all night long stay on those same Humvees Finally, at about 11 o'clock that night, we roll back out into the city streets. Because we have been shot to pieces so bad, because we have been repeatedly denied our request of support and armored vehicles, while we're in the force there, the United Nations comes to help us out. And the Pakistanis come with some tanks and the Malaysians show up with armored personnel carriers and other US Army uh, forces show up at our base and we roll back out in the city streets, my men on the same two Humvees and stay out there until nine o'clock the next morning. Now, it's very impressive that I roll back out in the city streets with three of the four tires shot flat underneath me, considering that that's run flat tires that are supposed to take lots of bullets before they actually go flat. And when I get back in the next morning, I wasn't prepared for what I saw. 
I'm literally the last vehicle to leave the target that night or the next morning. The tanks have already left, the APCs have already left, the rest of the U.S. forces have already left. And when I drove off of the force, when I drove off the target and make it back to the base, my buddies are already waiting for me. And I don't even get all the way off the Humvee before they come and grab me. And they start to ask me questions. And then they start to say, Jeff, I watched you in the city streets last night. And there was something different about you. You and I have the same training. We have the same equipment. We've been through the same experiences. But you had something on those city streets last night that I don't have. And I don't even know what it was. Or they said, Jeff, I listened to your voice on the radio. And when everybody else was totally freaking out, you sounded like you were completely calm. I don't even know how that's possible. And more than a few of my buddies walked up to me and they said, Jeff, I want what you have. I don't even know what it is, but whatever it is, I want that. And that's the moment that God threw me a curveball that I never saw coming. I planned to be an army ranger for the rest of my life. What I wanted to do was spend the next 30 years in the army kicking in doors and killing bad guys and just following Jesus at the same time. And that next day on the city streets in that Um, uh, as soon as I got off the Humvees, God radically changed my future. Actually, I switched teams that next day, and I didn't see it coming ever. I never really heard a voice from God in heaven, but this was as clear as anything that I've ever experienced in my life. I just felt God saying, look around you, Jeff. These guys aren't ready for eternity. And you are. And you have the chance to prepare these men for eternity. And the reason why you could do what you did last night is because you had already settled what happens to you after you die. But they don't even know what's going to happen to them next. And they're scared. And I want you, Jeff. Instead of preparing rangers to meet the enemies of America, I want you to prepare them for eternity. And it set me on a path to become an army chaplain with no college, no experience, never considering this in a million years, to come back on active duty and serve with the same Rangers and go to Iraq five times and Afghanistan nine times before retiring from the army. But I could go over there with those warriors and look them in the eyes and say, guys, I know exactly what you're going through. You know me. And you know what I've been through. And I can tell you firsthand, there is a difference. When you've met the king of the universe and the commander of the Lord's army goes on to the battlefield with you. In fact, let me remind you of what the great warrior poet King David said. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? I will fear no evil, and here's why. Because you go with me into that valley, God. And if you're with me in that valley, I've got nothing to fear. So I want to wrap this thing up in just a second. I want to pray over you. And then I'll, 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 if we have time, Jack, uh, I'll answer a few questions. But I want to use a little bit of my story to put into context something that you've read in the scriptures. In Joshua chapter 5, if I could describe for you what's about to happen. Joshua is an old man. Moses, the leader of leaders, is dead. And now I'm in charge. And I don't even know that Joshua ever wanted to be in charge. Early in Joshua chapter 1, tag, you're it. I don't care whether you want to be it or not. You're it, Joshua. And by the way, your job is to now go do what Moses didn't do. You're going to lead my people across the Jordan River into the promised land. And here's what's in front of you, Joshua. Nothing but war and bloodshed for the next generation. Have fun with this one. Go have fun, big boy. Is there any wonder in Joshua chapter 1 that he is scared to death and twice in one chapter God has to tell him, Joshua, be strong. Joshua, be courageous. Joshua, I'm with you. Joshua, all you need to know is that I'm going to be with you. And even then, Joshua is freaking out. So the nation of Israel, 
the sons and daughters of the ones that saw God part the Red Sea and deliver them out of slavery in Egypt are now crossing over the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. That Jordan River parts for them. And when it closes back up, they know there is nothing in front of me but war and there is no way to run run away. And in Joshua chapter 5, he's already gathered the nation around. They're standing outside the city of Jericho, and Joshua has already prepared them for the battle, and the battle is about to begin, and Joshua is a warrior who has been fighting and been uh, victorious in the past, but now the leadership is on his shoulders, and Joshua is scared, like any wise leader would be scared. So Joshua leaves the camp of Israel, and he goes to be alone in the wilderness. And somebody shows up to meet him. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked him, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Are you on our team or are you on their team? Because God has already told me everybody in Jericho is going to have to die except for one woman who has some scarlet rope hanging out of her window. I got to kill every man, every woman, every child. Their dogs and their cats have to die. That's how wicked this city has become. And the commander of the Lord's army, many people believe, and I tend to agree, this is Jesus Christ in the flesh with his armor on and his sword drawn. His answer is, neither. I'm not on your side, Joshua. I'm not on Jericho's side, Joshua. I'm on God's side. And God has showed up to this battlefield, Joshua. He says, neither. I have now come as the commander of the Lord's army. By the way, every time you see that phrase in the Bible, the Lord of hosts, that literally means the Lord of angel armies. I am the commander of the angel armies, and I'm here. So what do you got to worry about? And Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in homage, and he asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said, Joshua, You better take those sandals off your feet, buddy, because the place that you are standing is holy. You are in my presence. And I just want to remind you that when the commander of the Lord's army, when the king of the universe is on your side, you got nothing to be afraid of. The real reason why all of you in this room have bulletproof faith is not your training. It's not your tactics. It's not your gear. It is that the commander of the Lord's army goes into those fights. And sometimes the greatest fights are not a gunfight staring down the barrel of another weapon. Sometimes they're the moral battles in the boardroom and the planning rooms and in some of those really tough conversations (laughs) where somebody needs to stand up and speak for what's right. So I just want to tell you, I have had the chance to see firsthand what those morons in the United States will never ever know who are calling to defund the police and maybe we don't need law enforcement. Oh, really? Because I'll show you what it looks like. You don't have to look very far. In fact, when the Supreme Court of Somalia tried to meet together for the first time in 20 years, Al-Shabaab rolls up with the truck bomb and blows the building up and kills everybody. How dare you try to bring peace and order and stability to my environment. I'll do whatever I want because I've got more guns than you do and no one can stop me. And Emmett Burke is really right. There's the only one thing that will stop evil and it's good men and good women who will strap their weapon on their side and get up tomorrow and to go to work and to say, I don't even really wanna be in this situation, but if it comes to it, I will stand between evil and my society. And if I don't, who will? So this is my way of just trying to honor you. I have a really intense schedule, but the reason I took a few moments out to be with you guys this morning is to just say thank you. Thank you for what you represent in my country and in your countries. Thank you for the kind of commitment that you make. Would you let me pray for you?
our God in heaven, you are a just God. You are a holy God. You are a God that cannot tolerate evil. And you are also a gracious and a merciful God. And you give people a chance and you give people time to turn from evil and to run to you. But when they refuse to turn, thank you, God, for raising up warriors in the military and in law enforcement and in corrections that will strap on a weapon and will say, even though I don't want to be in these circumstances, if I have to kill those that would do evil to my countrymen, then I'll do it. Because justice demands it and because freedom is worth it. So so God, for my brothers and sisters in this room who have stood in between evil and their society, who minister to those who stand between evil and their society. God, strengthen them. God, use them. God, work in great power in their lives so that many people will be touched by their legacy and by the way that they follow Jesus and the way that they lead others. I pray this over my brothers and sisters now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Um, Thank you, guys. Thank you.